Ted King. <laughs> We're here in your home state of New Hampshire. That's right, welcome to town. That's so great to be here. And I couldn't think of a better place to be where the asphalt ends and the dirt road begins. Love it. It is the story of your career, I think. I think, I think there's some truth to that. Ted King is a retired Pro Tour racer who famously shepherded Peter Sagan to wins all over the world when they raced together. He now is a pro gravel racer. He's won the Dirty Kanza 200 twice. While we were here, I had to cook up with him and get some tips on how to ride gravel like a king. It's fun because you don't have to count calories like I did in a previous lifetime. You want to be sure that you are on top of hydration and nutrition. You're putting in 250 to 300 calories per hour. I don't want to die up here. And, and then I realized that all the guys have kids or have families and they don't want to die either. Ted, thank you so much for taking us out on your local roads. This is amazing. It's super pretty right now with all the foliage. Foliage is kicking. We call this peak. Yeah, it is it's super peak. I mean, I'm not far away in Massachusetts. Let's talk about that for a second. Both being New Englanders. Yeah, buddy. Not from England, like many people on the show, but from New England, it's pretty cool to be out here. Uh, we're practically born for gravel. There's so many dirt roads. I, I completely agree. I mean, it's super cool right now living in Vermont where there are literally more dirt roads than there are paved. Um, yeah, it's a blessing. Yeah, so we're here for your ride, which is the, uh, which is the King Challenge. So uh, we benefit the Kremple Center. The Kremple Center is a 19-year-old operation uh, started by David Kremples, but it is, it is an organization that benefits those with acquired brain injury, so if, often from from trauma or stroke um, or tumor. So my dad had a stroke in 2003 and he's been a member of this community. And in effect, it's where you go once you have passed all the therapies. Um, so it really is, you know, in cycling, we love community. And that is, uh, that's really what the Krimple Center is all about. Couldn't help, but obviously for nine years, I've been wanting to come out. I've always, <laughs> it falls during cross season. It is a so busy time of year. I have been able to come out and I thought this year we're coming out and we're gonna do a video, not only because we've been talking a lot about gravel on GCN and all the, you know, all the, like when we started doing this, these bikes were not at all designed for what we're doing. But now these bikes are like, these bikes are made for this type of stuff. I just wanted to pick your brain on it. Give the people some tips from, well, I said last before, but a king of gravel. I mean, if you uh, have, we have to play that up. <laughs> we have to, that'll be the last time I say it, but we have to. I love it, I love it. <laughs> so you've done some pretty long events. Let's talk about some of the, some of the events that you've done. Uh, yes, sir. Dirty Kansas is one that's on my mind. That is, for anyone that doesn't know, 200 kilometers long. 200 miles, my friend. I'm sorry, 200 miles long. So it's 200 miles long. Yes. Let's talk about that for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah. How, yeah. Is, that, how is that different than, say, like a, a Perry roubaix or like a Grand Tour stage? How is DK different than that? So 2016, there I am, my first year of retirement from road racing. And on a whim, I was asked to do Dirty Kanza. And I knew I, I had a handful of characteristics that would suit me. I know how to ride long distance. I know how to ride on rough terrain. I know how to do a bunch of things, but you don't collectively know how it all comes together, like something like DK. So, you know, I went in as best prepared I could, but all of a sudden you're self-supported. It's not the world of the world tour anymore. How does it compare? Uh, well, let's say the obvious ones. It's a longer effort than any Grand Tour stage. It's a longer effort than uh, Perry Roubaix, you're you're you got to go into it expecting to do at least a 10-hour day. It's totally a race of attrition. Being self-supported is a really cool attribute of a lot of these gravel races. How are you preparing for that? Obviously, we know that you own a nutrition company. Oh, but what is what is it like to prepare for a 10-plus-hour race nutritionally? 
Let's talk about that. Um, it's fun because you don't have to count calories like I did in a previous lifetime. Um, you're counting as many calories as you can possibly take in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, over the course of a 10 plus hour day, you wanna be sure that you are on top of hydration and nutrition. You're putting in 250 to 300 calories per hour for at least 10 hours. Um, it is brutally hot in, in Kansas in early June, so you gotta be on top of your hydration. Oh. Uh, drinking at least a bottle an hour, often at one to two bottles per hour. So, yeah, things that you can't have a hiccup or else you're gonna find yourself on your back foot at, you know, hour six. With, sure. With many, many, many more hours to go. <laughs> what I really like to emphasize is eating real foods, to be honest. I mean, I think, you know, there's nothing better than going on a sweet ride and linking it together with a coffee shop. Go and eat like a brownie, a muffin, a cookie, a scone. Yeah. I have choked down too many pieces of sports and juice in my life to really have any desire to do that anymore. Hydration. I definitely say drink, 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 and then when you think you need to drink some more, definitely drink some more. I mean, electrolytes are key. That is a way to, to really maximize your hydration. If you're in a pinch and you don't have them handy, water is gonna be better than nothing. But a lot of these gravel races are in the heat of the summer. They're in the heat of humidity, and you are, you are expelling an absurd amount of, of fluids, so you gotta be ahead of the fluids. What, what about when you get into the race you're at a you're at the, the mile 75. There's a rest stop with water. What is the protocol? Is it gentleman's agreement? Everyone pulls off to the Ooh. side and grabs water. Does someone keep going and you guys all look sideways and you like hunt that person uh, down that didn't stop? Because you guys you guys can't you guys can't hold 200 correct. miles worth of water on your bike. Correct. You know that's a really interesting question. That is that is what we see in this this changing state of gravel. Um, I like the races that, that you find yourself in the right group and then you can have that agreement to say, guys, we're gonna stop here. Right. You know, your headset's loose, I gotta pee, and, and Steve here on the left needs to get a, <laughs> grab some water. Like, as long as you have that good, good community, you don't want somebody to have a bad day as a result of a mechanical, as a result of not being hydrated. So you want guys to you guys want you got want guys to win with their legs. Exactly. But hydration's a tough one, man. It's in the middle of that. It is. So, right, I mean, you want to also be smart, be aware, be, be aware of where the feed zones are, be aware of the distances that you're gonna have to go between feed zones. So you've really made a self, name for yourself after the Pro Tour, now coming into gravel. It's booming, it's literally booming, in the US at least, and globally. I mean, you were doing a race in Iceland. Yep, yep, yep. Let's that talk was... about that for a second. How long was that one? That was, uh, it was 200K, so 120 miles. Um, Desolate. We, we literally raced out from an already desolate town and raced around the volcano called Hecla. Was it cold there? Um, it was not cold. It was, it was late July. It was windy, kind of like today. It was overcast. It was raining. It was snowing. It was sleeting. We literally saw everything over the course of the day. We had Oliver go over for a GCN and he did it. Yeah. And I think it was... Uh, I think it was a bit challenging for him, not being a gravel star. <laughs> that was a doozy of a race. Um, <laughs> he had a lot of things to say about it. Do you, would you consider yourself to be into the kind of the nasty conditions, like the bad stuff? Yeah, I mean, honestly, going into DK this year, for example, this is the first year we see a lot of world tour guys coming over from uh, EF and track. And, and I was really looking forward to the crap weather because I thought, it becomes a big mental game as much as anything. Yeah. Um, and I figure, you know, if it's pouring rain, the mud is turning to peanut butter. And it's very cyclocross of you, too. Oh, my Lord, right? Thank you. I appreciate it. It's a good, it's a good Amish in New England crappy weather. What I tell a lot of people, a lot of friends, world tour buddies who are getting into it, I say at some point over the course of the day, you're going to be in a very, very dark place. Yeah. So you just have to anticipate that. Um, you also have to anticipate random stop signs and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about your machine here. We got a Cannondale Synapse. This is uh, this is effectively Cannondale's uh, cobble bike. So this is the bike they're racing in the Spring Classic. What's funny about gravel is it's it's often one bike fits all. But then you know you can really nerd out on the nuances, and that's what I have the privilege to do. So tomorrow, for example, is largely a road ride with a little bit of very tame gravel. So a bike like this 
is, is largely meant for, for pave and, and traditional paved roads. This is also the identical bike. This is the bike that I won SBT gravel on. Um, so going to an event like that, 140 miles along, I know it's gonna be a whole lot of gravel of a variety of, of types, but overall it's tame. So, you know, you don't need a knobby tire. Um, what we have going on here, it's pretty traditional gear ratio. Two by up front, uh, uh, 11 speed in the rear. Um, whereas the gnarlier gravel races, you're gonna wanna have a lot of tread on the tire. You're gonna want perhaps even bigger or easier gear ratios. Um, and that's where you might go with, as we call it, mullet protocol. Mullet protocol is business up front, party in the rear. So one by, 44 tooth front, eagle in the back, 1050 gearing. So you can just spin up on up anything. Um, Iceland is a perfect example of that where you're gonna have a lot of short, steep pitches. So you volcanoes. wanna save, exactly. Mainly volcanic volcanoes. Volcanic ash. You wanna save your legs over the course of the day. So spin to win. Um, I've always been a high cadence kind of guy. What about what about tires? What are you doing for tires? This these uh, you said these were 32s, but these look pretty big to me. These, if I said 32, I misspoke. These are actually 35, which is super cool that you can fit this on a traditional road bike. Yeah. So tubeless 35C tires. These are by the good folks at Renee Hearse. When would you say like, okay, I need to get a knobbier tire or a semi slick? There's every kind of tire that you could imagine right now? That is the truth. Uh, that's probably the number one question I get when I am going to an event. Ted, what pressure are you running? What tire are you gonna run? How, how slick is it? How knobby is it? Given that these tires are tubeless and virtually all tires that I'm doing in a gravel run are tubeless, you get so much grip just by running lower pressure. So slicks are awesome in, in most events so long as it is dry. Once you know there's gonna be either some wet or muddy or a little bit gnarlier conditions, that's where we're gonna go with a knobbier tire. You, you ride the tire that matches the condition in theory, right? If you know it's gonna be super muddy, you're thinking, okay, I better ride this tire, but it's not gonna be as efficient. So it is always that kind of like that seesaw of like, eh, do I give a little here? Cause it's gonna be slower if I have to push it, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot safer cause there's tons of big rocks, all that stuff. I agree. Um, you're going over super long distances. So there's typically not a ton of cornering. I mean, yeah, gravel events can be 20 miles. They could be 220 miles. Um, in these shorter events, that's where they might get a lot more technical and that's where you're gonna wanna have some some chunk on your tire, some knob on your tire. Yeah. But I think there's often a lot of over analysis that goes into tire. I think having a tire with tread when you're gonna need to do a, a more technical ride, that's great. And then on more straightforward rides, like people look at this all the time and think, is that gonna be enough? And I say, absolutely, especially with that lower pressure. Yeah. I am a, a huge proponent of, of tubeless in gravel. Um, you want to have some good sealant in there. I've been riding with, what do you call these things? Plugs? Yes. That's a new attribute to my repertoire that I have and going so on. And so tell me about what, what happens with a plug. You're riding along. <laughs> You've got the sealants going everywhere, you but see the, the sealant's sealant. supposed to seal it. Every once in a while, you're gonna hit something that is gonna be bigger than what sealant can seal. So, you quickly pull to the side of the road. You, I highly recommend you have your plug in your back pocket ready to go, pull it right out, boom, stick it into the hole, and then hopefully that plug is gonna seal your, your malady. Um, what you wanna remember is, as you stick the plug in, and it continues to leak air, why don't you flip that tire over so the sealant can seal what is now a plugged hole. Whoa. Get going again. Um, while we're on topic, yeah. it's important to have your CO2s handy because you probably lost some air at that point. Yep. But here, let's go through the contents of my saddlebag. You got a tube, you got your plug, you got tire levers, you got a tool, and uh, I don't know, a little bit more CO2, just in case you got a gas up the old jet. All right, Ted, so let's talk about pedals because I've seen you at different gravel events. Sometimes you're riding road pedals. Sometimes you're riding mountain bike pedals. This is um, somewhere in the middle. What makes you pick one versus the other? So what we got going on here is a speed play pave pedal. Um, this is a pedal that speed play created for, for the gnarly fields of Northern Belgium. Basically, if you're gonna be getting off your bike to avoid a crash or something when you're racing through Belgium and you need to step off your bike into stuff exactly like this, you can re-engage. So 
This is an opportune pedal for a gravel race when you don't anticipate getting off your bike for more than about two steps. But beyond that, if you know that there's a river crossing, if you know there is gonna be a whole lot of mud or, or really averse terrain, that's when a, a mountain bike pedal is gonna be more in your wheelhouse. Got it. Um, any sort of running event up something steep, I don't know, running is part of your former cycling repertoire. Running's hard, so I don't do a whole lot of that, but in those events, I know that I wanna be reaching for a mountain bike pedal. You also did a ride called that you called the James Bay Descent. That is correct. What was the temperature of that? Well, conveniently, <laughs> negative 40 is where Fahrenheit and Celsius overlap. Okay. And on day one, it was negative 40 degrees. Um, that is a vicious, vicious cold. That was also the day that I got frostbite on my nose and I realized that you can't let your nose or any skin be exposed for that matter. Oh um, my gosh. What, hey, hang on, bring it back. So what did you wear? You know, it turns out your body is something of a furnace. So as you're riding, you wear very, very little. I would wear a nice Velocio shell with a uh, thermal long sleeve under that. But truth be told, so long as you're moving, you're producing so much heat, it's not until you stop that two down jackets would go on. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, now it's time to not freeze to death. Seven days long. Seven days. And? It was how long was it? 600 kilometers. 500K. Okay. Um, but when you're riding a fat bike and your max speed is somewhere around 10K an hour, it takes a really, really long time. Um, it was gnarly. It, it opened my eyes up to bike packing, to what negative 40 degrees feels like, what's it like to be in polar bear country. Laura really, really wants me to come home from this trip. I don't want to die up here. And, and then I realized that all the guys have kids or have families and they don't want to die either. In that type of environment, what do you eat? <laughs> because it seems like everything would either be frozen or um, it'd be like uh, astronaut food. Yes, well, you actually do do that. That's So we can work backwards from there. Dinner is uh, camping meals where you have a bag and you pour boiling water in it and, and that is your meal. And it turns out the three cheese macaroni is delicious. You know, you are fueling throughout the day. You're riding, throwing in a whole lot of sugar, a whole lot of carbohydrates, so a lot of untapped maple syrup, uh, cookies, trail mix, chocolate, peanut butter. Uh, peanut butter would begin to get a little bit frozen, so you put that under your, under your jacket. You gotta, you gotta create your own water. So you're boiling water in the beginning of the day, you're, you're making coffee with, uh, with that hot water, you got your oatmeal in the morning. Um, it's a how pretty did you keep rudimentary your, living. How did you keep your water from freezing? Um, you have really nicely insulated bottles okay. that if you fill them up, I think they're about yay big, then you're gonna get, as soon as they are beginning to freeze, that is when they're, you basically run them dry, and then by then it's basically the end of the day and you're, you're ready to set up camp. And off camera, you were joking that, uh, or maybe it was on camera, you were joking that you're gonna do it again? The crazy guys are gonna do it again. Um, the invitation has gone out. Coincidentally, they're thinking of doing it in March, and March is when my wife is due with our first child. So That's a I probably won't be going a, on that a trip. blessing. Yes, on a couple different fronts. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That is some travel tips with the king, Ted. Thank you very much for your time today. If you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you wanna check out other great gravel videos, Ted. You're gonna to wanna to click right over here. <laughs> and uh, if you wanna to subscribe to GCN, you know how to do it. All right, Ted, let's get out of here. Let's do it, fun riding.